Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Son of a Blitch podcast. I'm your host, George Blitch. And today I got a special treat for you. I just had an interview with the band Princess Goes. Uh, you guys may have formerly known them as Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum. And they are just amazing amazing artists uh they have a new album called come of age that just dropped earlier this month and uh right now they're about to embark on their first leg of the u.s tour they just did a uk european tour um and just wrap that up we talk a little bit about that and kind of what's to be expected and maybe what songs you're going to be hearing from um them on the new u.s uh, tour uh, obviously they had their first album thanks for coming they have a self-titled ep so they have you know 30 to 40 songs that they're choosing from and playing they also have a vip experience so so if you guys are going to go and check them out while they're on tour, definitely for, I think it's like a hundred bucks, you go ahead and meet the band, you get an acoustic performance. Uh, I think you get a signed poster as well uh, and a chance to get some uh, pictures with them as well. So, you know, hey, it sounds like a heck of a deal. I strongly suggest you guys check that out. I'll have all the links below for you guys to check out their music and to uh, learn more about their tour. Um, you know, for those who aren't, aren't familiar, I wanted to tell you about a little bit the band members. Uh, Michael C. Hall is the singer. You guys might have known him from his time on Broadway. He's been a part of uh, Hedwig, um, which is where the entire band met. Um, Lazarus with David Bowie. Uh, he's also been an actor in uh, many shows. You guys might know him as when he played the character uh, Dexter or David Fisher in Six Feet Under. Uh, Matt Katz Bowen is the keyboardist, bassist, guitarist, the guitarist. Um, you know, he has written music and toured with Blondie. Uh, he's done a lot of amazing, amazing work. Um, and obviously, uh, Peter Yenowitz, the drummer, he's played with the Wallflowers, Natalie Merchant, Morning Wood. Uh, and again, all three of them were working with Hedwig when they first met and decided to uh, form a band, or rather the band formed them, however you want to look at it. But Guys, I really want you to check out Come of Age. This album is amazing. Um, I think it's a culmination of a lot of their experiences and talents working together, and it's just a mind-blowing record. Um, and definitely go check out Thanks for Coming and their EP. I think you should get them all and start absorbing them and go see them on tour. So once again, guys, enjoy this podcast with Princess Goes. And without further ado, here we are. Hey, fellas, welcome. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying congratulations on your amazing uh, new album, Come of Age, your second full-length album. Uh, it came out earlier this month, and it's a great record. I know you guys just got back from a 10-date tour, you played all across the UK, Paris, Germany, Netherlands. Um, while it's still fresh in your mind, I wanted to maybe ask each of you, what were some of your favorite moments and memorable experiences uh, from that tour? Playing in Paris was pretty great, um, as you mentioned, because a lot of them don't speak any English, and they just would come up to us and speak, start speaking French, which we don't really speak, you know. I'm not hardly at all, but it was still very sweet because you could tell we all felt the love, I think. And um, yeah, it was very sweet, in spite of what they say. Had you been <laughs> in Paris before, personally? Yeah, I have a couple yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. But it's an, it's an amazing thing to go to uh, uh, a club that you odds are you'd never otherwise visit with a room full of people you'd otherwise never see and will likely not see again and share this sort of 90 minutes uh, and uh, have the experience that some of them are familiar with your music and like it or it, it means something to them. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, it's really gratifying. Yeah. What about you, Peter? What was the experiences uh, that maybe caught your attention and your, your memory? We played on some bit like in the Netherlands we did we played twice in Utrecht and we played uh the second show was on this really big big stage in a, like an or orchestra hall uh called the Tivoli uh where you know like the Stones have played and Nick Cave and we we were part of this Dutch poetry night which was this was one of the random shows on tour that we got at, got added after we had booked the whole tour they asked us to come back for five songs at this Dutch poetry night that it was based on an event that Allen Ginsberg kind of spearheaded in Amsterdam, you know, I think maybe in the seventies um, called Dutch poetry night with all the famous Dutch poets and other poets and musicians. And so that was a really cool highlight. We played on a big stage in front of more people than I think we've ever played. And uh, also in London, we played at this amazing place called earth uh, with an, another ginormous stage when we walked in it was an old like dilapidated movie theater that had probably had different different uses over the years and it, it looked like 
something out of like Clockwork Orange or something, but that was also a gigantic place. Sounded like a gigantic place, but a beautiful visual place. I mean, we had as much stage in front of us as we did behind us. So it was like, we were on like a football field. It felt like, and it makes for a really cool, you know, I think we, we, we played in some little dive bars on this tour. We played in some big, you know, spectacular places like the last two. So it's just, yeah, like Mike said, it's just cool to go somewhere, you know, and people know our songs and are singing. And, you know, we got to meet a bunch of fans this time and that was made it really kind of special and always cheered us up. Well, and you guys are about to embark on your first leg of the U S tour. And from what I understand, you guys are kind of going to do it in little segments, maybe, you know, 10 or 12 shows at a time, take a break, go back to the families and then kind of regroup and do the next leg. And during that uh, tour, you guys are doing a VIP kind of meet and greet. And uh, can you kind of talk a little bit about the reasoning of, you know, maybe wanting to do these in like shorter legs. Um, I, I assume there's probably some burnout that you don't want to hit, but also maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that VIP experience and what that may offer for your fans. Yeah, no, was, I think that's, you put it very well. I think um, I have two kids who are in school. Mike has a kid, you know, I think we need to, um, you know, we don't want to be away from them too long. And um, yeah, it's kind of a beautiful thing to be able to go and play a few shows and then come back home and, and uh, just do it like that. And yeah, as far as the VIP experience, we play a song for them and um, then we get to meet them, um, offer some life advice. You know, Peter <laughs> has some really good one-liners. Um, and, you know, we take photos with them. And, um, yeah, it's just kind of a love fest. It's it's a really nice time. That's great. That's great. Well, you know, thinking about that that tour that's coming up, I was very curious about your set lists. Obviously, you guys have two full-length albums. You have an EP, the self-titled. And I was just kind of curious, is there – is there is it kind of equally spread throughout your you know discography there or is there something that you guys are is it evolving and changing i think i saw a notes on one of your interviews with a gentleman either from the netherlands or from paris and you know there's things scratched out and you know rearranged stuff so i was kind of curious is there you know what that looks like is that something that you guys kind of have an idea of these songs or at the last minute does something else come in you know how are you guys setting that up for the tour yeah i think we um we, this this tour uh was unique because we the record came out while we were on tour so um aside from the singles we were released um a lot of the material from the new record was still um under wraps and, until the very end of the tour um that said we probably played i don't know five or six songs for the new record we the set was um like 20 songs so we played a good number from the first full length, some from the EP, and there was some tweaking. Um, some some songs went away. Some uh, made their way into the set. Um, some of the order changed. Um, this next time we go out, we'll probably tweak it again. Um, in part because the record's out now, so we'll maybe maybe. Uh, have a little bit more uh, stuff from the new record in the set, but I'm, um, you know, it's fun it, playing playing songs um, live from the new record. It, it's like a, it's almost like the final stage in the in the life of discovering a song. You know, playing it live and 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 feeling it out and and seeing how it how it plays to an audience. Um, you learn so much about a song that you can't otherwise know when you when you take that step so we'll look forward to doing that with some additional songs this this next go around well in in that same kind of vein of thought i was wondering are there some songs that you know you guys had from you know the b or from uh thanks for coming that have evolved as you guys have become you know closer friends i mean obviously you met a hedwig you were, were it, there has been many years you've had friendships and the the development of the band but as you guys get to know each other better musically and, you know, just the connectivity of your friendships and, and kind of family that you're, you're building, are there some songs that have particularly evolved and kind of maybe brought in a new life of their own while you're playing it live or even, you know, just as you guys are rehearsing that have really kind of morphed that you can kind of identify? Yeah. Um, well, I would say 
we learn, like Mike said, we learn a lot when we play live. We, t- we took an early version of Blur Out on the last UK tour in 21. It was more of like, you know, heavy hitting, kind of like uh, a little bit more in the U2 world. Uh, it was more standard and kind of, it was it was it was rock and song, but we we played it live. It had it hadn't come out yet, and uh, I think I don't know. At least in my mind, it felt like we needed to go back to the drawing board, and we just stripped it, stripped the the same produced song down to just Mike's voice and one of Matt's synths, and we redid it as like a darker synth wave kind of you know minimal track that had only a few elements on it, uh, and it, it just seemed to come to life to where that was just an example of a song that we, it's, we, we took it out on the road. We, we, we learned from it. We came back and started over almost. And uh, I'd say whatever whispers, same thing. It's that, that grew out of a jam Matt and I had in our studio on this old piano that we have in it. It, uh, we had it for a little while. And it, I think Matt turned us on to this band uh, a couple of years ago called Bum- Bum- Bumba Estereo from Brazil, a really cool, latin latin pop band and uh i don't know we just went back and and just stripped it down again and tried a different treatment to it and and that that would song grew to be what it is on come of age a completely different take on it um so yeah and you know songs like uh vicious from our first ep you know i'm always taken aback every time we play it by how big it feels live and how it grows you know it's got almost a life of its own there's a few songs like that um maybe matt and mike can i think offering felt that way too like there it's uh, you know that's been the new record but playing it live it kind of goes to another place um that we only discovered playing it live you know we we, right we didn't uh so you feel the same, Matthew? Is there some some that stick out, or kind of the ones that they kind of mentioned that? Yeah, I yeah, with? those songs, and then "Let It Go" as well mm-hmm. as another song on the new album that we released as a single last year, I think. And it was um, was it last year that we released it, or two? Years yeah, ago? about a year ago. About a year ago, and um, you know, we made some changes, um, kind of subtle changes, but just just sort of um, things that I think help help the song move forward and then we have a song called land of make pretend or lomp as the acronym and that's what we've been playing for these meet and greet um people and that song has just gone through um sort of an infinite number of rewrites and revolutions and um we may have to release an entire album of that song um you know just different versions sort of an operatic version um you know an industrial metal version just you name it do you guys have um a lot of maybe friends or other artists who have remixed some of your songs or that you've maybe given them you know some of the the, the software in, to be able to go and, and work with that and are there some that kind of stick out because i know there are some remixes that have been out i was just curious if there's any that kind of caught y'all's attention or that you really uh maybe helped work on or, or promote yeah, I think the um, the ketamine remix um, that the Armed did certainly stands out. I don't know if you're familiar with that band, the Armed. I'm not yet. Check them out. They're pretty. They're pretty. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they are. They're they're sort of this collective. They're like they don't even they don't like to call themselves a band necessarily, but um, their remix of ketamine is is completely sick. And so is Brandon Boast, our mix engineer. He did a remix of Ketamine that's um, quite beautiful in a very different sort of way. Um, very poignant and very beautiful. Nice. Any other ones jumping out for the other guys? Or um, I mean, that that's the, the song that, I mean, we actually, as a kind of experiment, did, a I guess, an EP of, what was it, four remixes uh-huh. of, of Ketamine. And... Um, there's um is it Fika is my name um yeah. from um um Finland they actually um opened for us for some of our European dates they did a remix of that song uh for us but uh, that was a lot of fun yeah I'd, I'd like to yeah I think we'd all be interested in doing that with with some other tracks or not doing it just sort of 
giving it to people to do what they will with you know it's really yeah, interesting yeah. to uh to see what comes of that oh some of my buddies in pendulum had done the same thing they had i guess a certain number of out, like records that they had on their uh that they had to put out with their record company and they're like okay we're gonna do a, a, a remix stuff and just send it out to everyone it's just really neat to see other people's iterations of, of what they're putting together um yeah. kind of a, a question i had about y'all's gear um and like I, I used to play in a, a live PA band and like electronic dance music stuff. And a lot of times, you know, when I'm performing uh, for the record, there's a bunch of different instrumentation. And whenever you go to play live, there was usually two, maybe three of us. And we had to have something to help kind of facilitate all those other sounds that were maybe on the album. So I was kind of curious about what you guys are doing as far as um, your setup maybe, you know, what software you're running and, you know, what kind of gear do you have? I know maybe start with you, Peter. I know you've got, it looked like a rolling kit there. And then you have, what is that the, kind of an Octopad, uh, you know, something on the side. I was kind of curious what it is that you're running and then, you know, we'll jump to you guys as well. Yeah. Nice one. We, we did. Yeah. We, cause we record in union square, New York in like a residential building, which you know, we get a lot of noise complaints and I, I, I have a V drum set rolling kit in there. So it just allows me to be able to practice and play drums in New York city, uh, which would be impossible with real drums. So right. the cool thing about the V drums is it's got the brain on it and just change, you know, between like an 808 kit or like, you know, a 909 or any kind of like weird electronic sound, or um, I could put my own sounds in from the record and a lot of real drum sets on there. And yeah, that is mm -hmm. an octopad. Uh, as well and those were just things that I had laying around the studio and they've sort of evolved into being part of our sound and that you know we when we first started making music we 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 never set out to be any kind of band we just used whatever shit we had laying around the studio both of our studios Matt's and mine and um, we have an old piano that's sitting in the studio that is a half step out of tune and just sounds like a hundred year old piano that ends up on a lot of our recordings just because that's the piano we have. You it's know, there, so right. Yeah. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think looking ahead to new stuff, we'll probably, you know, look forward to getting into another studio space with a bunch of different sounds and different bunch of different colors on our palette. And I'll let Matt tell you about that. Matt's the genius behind how we do a lot of this stuff live with his computers and. Oh uh, yeah. So thanks Peter. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, what what did you use, George? First, what what kind um, of? I had a TD twenty whenever I was there, and a TD ten previous to that. Um, whenever I was performing, I was doing live percussion, um, and then we had a laptop um, running Logic, and then my bandmate would play guitar, um, grab the bass. Uh, he later had a brain tumor, which kind of made him not be able to use motor function in his left hand. So we had to kind of adapt a little bit more and uh, kind of have a lot of samplers and, and different sequencers that were kind of playing that music. But it was mainly just two of us, and he did a lot of vocals. I did some MC-style work and things. But every show was a little bit different, but we kind of had to adapt. And, you know, I remember hearing a story about how you now use the MIDI plug-in on your guitar because uh, sometimes the MIDI had gone out and things like that. So I would heard about different, you know, different bands that have to deal with these things live. And I was kind of curious, you know, are you using a laptop? Do you have something as a backup? And what do you kind of, you know, what are you forming when you're, you're kind of producing these songs, you know, redoing them live? Yeah, yeah, totally. What, what I love about that stuff is every band, um, a lot of bands do some kind of software sampling or mm -hmm. sequencing, but everyone does it slightly differently. Like everyone kind of, does it in their own way, which is really interesting. And the way they integrate it with the live show um, is really cool. So I play with a Phantom, a Roland Phantom keyboard. It's the G series, um, which is an older keyboard, but I like it a lot. Um, and that's sort of the main keyboard sounds. Then the guitar is plugged in via MIDI cable into that keyboard, which um, so the guitar is drawing the sounds from that keyboard. Um, which was, it was also kind of a necessity thing where we just didn't have enough inputs to accommodate adding another inch, you know, the guitar inputs. So we're using the phantom inputs for that. Um, but luckily the sounds are great, I think. And then, um, as far as sequencing Ableton live has yeah. been sort of there since the beginning, um, it's just sort of 
super easy, super, um, I started using Cubase, you know, like that was the first DAW that I learned on and the Cubase is great, but it's, it's kind of laborious and, um, and Ableton is quick and simple and, and it's super fun to do. So, so yeah, that's the vibe now. Nice. And then you're playing bass on some tracks, guitar on as well. I mean, I saw the acoustic guitar. I know that's probably for, you know, the VIP meet and greet, but are you bringing that on stage uh, live when y'all are playing some tunes as well? Yeah. Yeah. The acoustic we use for the song Beja mm -hmm. which starts with this big rock guitar intro and um, you know, everyone's hands go up in the air. It's like one of those kind of moments. So yeah, we do it with that. And it's also just great to have an acoustic guitar around um, you know, cause then you know that if everything else goes to shit, Hey, at least we have an acoustic guitar. <laughs> well, and I saw, I think Peter, you were doing some, uh, thigh drumming on one of the recordings I saw too. So I expect a thigh drum solo at, at one of these shows that I go to. I, I definitely want to see that. <laughs> Hell yeah. George. That's kind of good. Good deal. Michael, are you, um, having any effects processors, any foot pedals or things you're operating, or is there someone who's behind the mixing board kind of running any type of effects on your vocals? Yeah, that's uh, our our sound guys doing that. Um, early on, I, I <laughs> sang to this PC Helicon thing that would try to like um, simulate uh, if if there were if there were things on the recording where I was singing in in two octaves at once, I would mess with it to try to achieve that. But we were able to get a little more sophisticated um, with with that and and um, and uh so so yeah i'm left to i'm standing behind the all this all this mat in front of all this madness with just my microphone because i'm a i'm a tech tard um when i was kind of curious i mean obviously you've performed and broadway shows you've done things uh you know musically before obviously working <laughs> in lazarus and um you know, previous performances of being on stage or, you know, being behind the camera. And I was curious, um, is this your first band to be in or have you played in other bands before? No, um, this is it. I, I, I mean, I guess technically the first band that I fronted was the band in the Hedwig and the Angry Inch, right. the, the Broadway show where I met Peter mm -hmm. and where Peter subsequently reintroduced himself to Matt. And I mean, that was kind of a, a catalyst for the three of us meeting and, and for this all happening. Um, so that gave me a taste for it. Um, but no, no, it's, um, you know, I always did a lot of singing growing up from the time, you know, I was in a boys choir, you know, before my voice changed. Um, so a long time ago, um, and have sang as an actor, as mm -hmm. you said, but, um, yeah, never, never been in a band. Um, it just, you know, didn't, didn't sort of fall that way uh until it did <laughs> um, it, it, but it, it's, it's a great it's first band that i <laughs> yeah it's not something i ever anticipated would happen you know I, it's um, just total total good fortune and serendipity you know that i that i that i hooked up with these guys and that we found that we were able to somehow without without thinking too hard about it or talking too much about it make songs together well walk me through maybe that that idea of like how you guys obviously you're working together on the project but then did somebody say you know what we should jam together like hey why don't we come over here and see what we can do together and then what did that first time musically you know look like did you guys have some songs that you had had maybe pre-recorded that you brought to the table or did you guys sit down and talk about an idea of kind of maybe what you wanted to do or was it just kind of super organic and just happened and you're just hanging around one day and poof the band began a little bit of that yeah matt, matt and i went on the head week tour uh after the broadway show closed and we we just got really close and enjoyed each other's company so much when we got back to new york you know i think you know just started hanging out at the studio and we're both musicians so inevitably we just pushed record and it caught a lot of those early jams that we made together and one of them one of them was called a uh, love American style on our first EP. And the other, another one was vicious. I think Mike and I had dinner one night and I brought him back to the studio and I played him the instrumentals and he noticed there was no vocals and just, just offered to, you know, throw some vocals down. And 
very shortly after that, he was in the studio. I think he wrote some lyrics on the subway ride downtown and we put, put vocals on love American style first. And it was just, I mean, I guess, you know, there is something to that first time, you know, first kiss thing of it all. And I don't know, I just, it was so beautiful and so unexpected, I think is the word that Matt and I would use as well, just to hear, to send that track around at the end of the day, being like, what the hell is this? Like it, whatever it is, let's just keep doing it. And we did vicious. And then, you know, pretty soon we just had like four or five songs and then we had 10 and we were like, wait, what's happening here? Like we were literally playing catch up the whole time. And it was kind of fun because that that's happened very few times in my life and my creative life. It's so much of it is, you know, Hey, let's do this or let's do that. Or do you want to do this? And what should we do? You know, this one, we feel like we've all been playing catch up to this energy that we're, you know, obviously we're in it, but I also feel like it's bigger than all three of us. And we're just kind of pinching ourselves to be able to create together. And it's hard to talk about. We don't really enjoy figuring out why, yeah. but we are also like, what the, what the hell is going on? Here? And now we have like 30 something songs and it's just like, holy shit, this is awesome. You know, a really unexpected life, life gift. That's wonderful. I'm I'm so glad to uh, hear that. And, you know, you guys put out, I mean, Come of Age is, is a wonderful album. Um, I'm just blown away by it. And I kind of wanted to ask a question, too, about the idea of the design and the cover. I believe it was Tim Richardson that you guys worked with and uh, also did some work with the Shimmer video, if I'm, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct there. And then I was kind of curious how you guys connected with him, how that connection came about. And then, you know, maybe if one of you guys wants to tackle the idea of the imagery of the album, and your transition from Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum to Princess Goes, that imagery from what I, I remember was like kind of an unspoken synergistic sequence of events. Then that because it I feel like symbolically there's something that somebody, if they wanted to, could draw into that imagery for the idea of the transition of the name. And so if you know y'all can kind of maybe tack t- you know tackle that question and and run with that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, we, we had uh, an, an acquaintance in common who thought that Tim might be a interesting candidate to do a video for us and invited him to see us play. Um, and he, he, he liked the show and um, we, we gave him a number of tracks and uh, he responded to Shimmer as one that he wanted to, to explore making a video for. Um, it was a video that originally was was going to be a lot um, less involved in terms of the um, the graphics and the post production element, but he just um, got um, inspired to to run with this idea, and we were like, "Yeah, man, run with it." And uh, I, I remember he would tell us about it, and he would send these little mock ups that looked like a sort of like bad video game from the eighties, you know, and he was just like, trust me, trust me, all these blanks are going to get filled in. And then when he showed us the final video, it was just like kind of mind blowing. Um, but in addition to making that video, he also, yeah, came up with that, that image of the skull made of like these albino butterflies and this crown of golden butterflies. And, um, and he did all that, um, at a time before we decided to shorten the name but yeah it did turn out that it was kind of a perfect image to transition to the shorter name and um i mean i don't think we're necessarily saying that the the butterflies are dead but there's (laughs) there's there's something about that 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 image that i feel like does um and the same goes for the video you know he just sort of intuited something about the feel of that song that felt totally right and the image of that skull feels simultaneously foreboding and beautiful and heavy and dark and also kind of light and um i'd like to think that maybe those kind of um juxtapositions or extremes are alive in our music my dog's barking um but uh yeah um it's just another kind of or, or like a really primary example of um, collaborating with someone and just letting them run with their inspiration because of an intuitive sense that they kind of get us. And um, everything Tim came up with is sort of next level and very much just 
in sync with our uh, uh, sensibility in ways that we couldn't have described to him or, you know, given him an assignment to come up with. He just kind of got it. Well, that kind of feels like what you guys are talking about just as your formation and you guys all coming together and that there's something that's going and almost feels like it's kind of pulling you along and you have this connectivity of it. And that may be just kind of another kind of, you know, layer of that with, with someone like Tim coming in, that this thing is just pulsing and y'all are just enjoying it and going for the ride. Um, so yeah, sometimes it, it's neat to, when, when those pieces fall in the right place and kind of help paint that picture, you know, <laughs> figuratively and literally, so to speak. So yeah, no, I, yeah. I'm, yeah, I like that. That's great. Um, one last question for each of you guys. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I, I was kind of curious if you were to bring one musician into the band to collaborate on a song or two, who would that be for each one of you? Alive or dead or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Alive or dead. <laughs> You're like, I have two different people. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I'd say uh, Donnie McCaslin. He um, is the band leader of the, the, band that played the music on the black star album david bowie's um uh, last record and it's just a phenomenal uh saxophone player and musician and improvisational player and uh, he kind of he plays in a way that's pretty uh, um otherworldly and um yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go with that i'm gonna go with him he's amazing that's maybe even something that could happen ah um, okay there we go. Hard time, Planting the seed. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. Let's make it happen. Let's nice. make it happen. Um, <clears throat> I think um, oof, there's there's so many. I saw Depeche Mode last night. And um, so now I've sort of been having them on the brain. You know, obviously, Martin Gore or David Gahan would be pretty great to do some kind of collab with. I'll put that out there. Um, but also the Polish artist named Hania Rani, who is um, just incredible. And I feel like she would also go really well with, with what we do. She's an electronic and piano artist. Awesome. What about you, Peter? Mike and Matt gave such good, cool answers that I'm going to go straight up cheesy and just say if we could get Taylor Swift in the room and just play anything she wants or sing anything that she wants um i think that would you know our like every band we're struggling to be heard and be seen and i mean not struggling but our, our challenge is to you know we want to get as many ears as we can on our music and share this music with as wide of a community as we can and i think nobody's got as much reach as her right now so i'm just going to go with her just just selfishly because i want to I want to get people to know about this band, you know. Give us a chance, Taylor. If you can hear this, <laughs> give us a chance. George, make it happen, man. I'm going to make some phone calls, man. I'm going to send this through. My buddies, uh, I mentioned the band earlier, Pendulum. They actually did a cover of one of, of Taylor's tracks, and I guess they responded to her. So maybe I'll call my buddy KJ, the drummer, and be like, all right, make this happen, guys. Come on. So <laughs> Yeah, and no disrespect. You know, I, I want to say I'm, I'm a fan of hers. I think she's incredible, and she writes on, you know, writes her own songs, and she's a, she's a real deal, you know. It's like, so you put that in there, too. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have, like, 23 producers on one track yeah no it's always nice to see <laughs> well guys i really appreciate um y'all coming out and and joining the son of a Blitch podcast uh definitely want to have you guys out again when you're on tour i'm going to come and try to uh, check out a set really want to see you guys live um before we go if you guys can go ahead you know throw your socials out there website where people can go and kind of jump on this train where they can go and get tickets to be able to see you i know you got november or is it December and January dates coming up here on the U S tour of uh, the first leg. And, uh, you know, how can people go ahead and, and kind of follow this journey and, and join along as well? Yeah, it's princessgoes.com and, um, Instagram is princess goes official. So Twitter, YouTube, princess goes official, all that stuff. Wonderful. Well guys, thanks again, once again for joining and, uh, best of luck and, and, uh, on the, the rest of the, the tours that you got going on. And, uh, thanks again for sharing this amazing music you guys came up with and, and you guys and sharing your talents on everything you've done. I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks you, George. George. Talk to Cheers. you, man. All right. Y'all take care. You too, man.